Alaska's prison system has been under the microscope. Lawmakers just passed a bill that rolled back some of the prison reforms of Senate Bill 91. And then there's Alaska's opioid epidemic, which has added fuel to the controversy. Joining us now to talk about that is Dean Williams, Alaska's Corrections Commissioner. Thanks so much for being on the program, mm -hmm. Commissioner. Thank, thank you, Emily, for having me. Let's start with SB 54. Of course, that's the bill that replaces <coughs> SB 91. How will that affect the prison system? Well, there are, I mean, most of the reforms that are still in place in terms of what we're trying to do behind the walls, and those are the ones that are most important to me. So those things haven't changed. Um, there are some things in Senate Bill 54 that did change some of the sentencing structures, but I kind of look at that this way, is that I, those are the cards I've been dealt with. Um, my job is to make uh, reforms behind the walls and things like, um, you know, the programs, any, like the Lullaby Project that's been going on and other things like that. Um, those, are, those are the things I'm out to advance and advocate for and make changes behind the walls. So I am going to, uh, some of the things that changed in 54, are going to drive some of my population's numbers north, what I say north, by a certain amount. We're not exactly sure yet, um, but I'll have to deal with that. But I'm mostly concerned about what we do behind the walls. So I'm concerned about what's happened in 54, but I'm really mostly concerned about what we're continuing to make changes inside our own department. You've been following SB 54. Some legal experts think that a part of it could be un unconstitutional, yet the governor says he'll sign it. Will that complicate things? Uh, I don't really, <clears throat> it won't complicate it for me. Um, uh, my job, like I said, is to do what I can with the cards that I've been dealt. Um, I'm, uh, everyone in that room who's making justice policy and, and revising statutes wants to Im improve public safety. That's all of our jobs. And people have different ways of getting there and different focuses about that. That's the struggle and the tension in the room anytime you make any of these kind of policies. Um, but for me, that's really not going to impact. I, anytime we're increasing counts, I have to take that into account. That's going to impact what I'm doing behind the walls, of course. Um, but there's still things I'm going to do regardless of what the counts are. Let's talk the opioid epidemic. It's hit all of us so hard, especially people in the prison system. Mm -hmm. How much of that was a factor in the rollback? Well, the... The opioid epidemic is a factor in so many things. I don't know if I want to pin all of that on what the rollback was about. I don't, I, I'm not sure I'm ready to make that connection. I'll just say this about the opioid epidemic. Um, it is touching all areas of one's life. If you talk to people who have children who are uh, drug addicted, and so um, there's no place that's immune from that. And uh, behind the walls, we're not immune from it either. Um, and so the, the opioid epidemic is around the country and it's in our state now and the challenge is what to do about it. Speaking of the opioid epidemic at Highland Mountain Correctional, right. five overdoses in one day, four women, one who overdosed twice. How does right. that happen? Um, well, as I said, we're not immune from the problem. In fact, I would say if anything, um, the people who are addicted outside the walls are still addicted behind the walls. And um, I, I have, we are much better now in terms of strategies about how we find out who's trafficking drugs. We have an entirely different system set up now. I have an internal affairs in my department that wasn't in existence when we took when I took over. Um, we have cooperations with the FBI, the DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office. So we're doing things quite differently. Uh, a lot of the public doesn't see that, but in terms of how our intelligence gathering and what we're doing with cases is entirely different. We just recently announced the, the U.S. Attorney's Office announced an indictment of three people. Um, that case that was just, uh, I think, announced yesterday uh, is a great example of interagency cooperation. And that doesn't sound very jazzy on one hand, but you don't make cases unless you really share information and share intelligence and strategies. And that's uh, one of the things we're doing in terms of the suppression end of things or enforcement end of things. Let's talk about the Lullaby Project. Mm. It's funded by a variety of nonprofits, so it's not funded by the state. Right. Is this increasingly important, having that nonprofit presence? Yeah, well, it's not only the importance of the nonprofits. I mean, I love this. I love these kind of projects. I love these are things uh, that I, I love going to. I love, um, I love being part of them. Uh, that's the great job of being commissioner. Um, but it's not only the nonprofits. The It's the business opportunities that I'm developing and where inmates are working. So there's a number of different angles I've taken since I've taken over to make sure that people in the public know that these are their prison systems. 
And this is just an, as an ours. We're not a cloistered group here of just running these places. I need everybody in this state to understand these prison systems are theirs. Um, because we need to do something about the reoffense rate and the recidivism rate of people coming out of prison. And um, the way you do that is involve others with you to lift, you know, to lift, help lift the, the heavy load. And um, so I love the nonprofit involvement in a deep way, but I also love some of the other things we're starting up too. But um, these kind of projects are just, are just excellent. And I know that they're the future for how we bring down the reoffense rate. The Lullaby Project can't save everyone, right? We <clears throat> recently learned that one of the women who participated in the program has since died of an overdose. How do we get to the root of the problem? Well, I've been looking at this really closely. Um, there's one really good thing about the law intervention and the legal system's intervention on someone who's a heroin addict. They're given a choice. And so a lot of things that the governor and everybody on the cabinet has been really focusing on is what to do now once the criminal justice system comes to play in your life if you're a heroin addict. And what other opportunities can we give you? Can we put a fork in your road? And so other states and other countries are a little bit ahead of us, but um, I just came back from a 50-state crime summit on this very same issue. And so one of the things I know is providing opportunities for people to say, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I got my hand up. Uh, like Sean and other people that we see that um, come to us who finally say, yep, I get it. This is all bad. And making sure that they have an opportunity to stop. Um, and give in, put in a fork in their road. And so we're working on very hard about creating those new opportunities, and other states are too. And, and I think um, we're all learning from each other about how to attack the problem. One of the, one of the things that you see coming out of the opioid crisis that we saw in the Lullaby Project is how families are affected. It's not just the prisoner. Oh, right. It's their families too. Right. Um, talk with, um, talk with a, a father or a mother of a heroin addict um, and get their story. It changes your life, it changes my life. Um, you can't help but talk to these people and know the, the pain they've all been under in terms of watching their loved one go down that road. Um, I have great hope, to be quite frank, in, um, in having those people come near me. I have, I have parents now, who, who have children who have, who have died of heroin addiction who are, who are close to me. Um, they pray for me, they pray for our department, um, and I need all those people near me to be quite frank, and so I think you have to see it from many different scopes of view. We all, we all want public safety. I don't want my car broken in, my house broken into. Um, but most of these people, uh, except for the heroin addiction or other addiction, are you and I. And talk to their family members, they are you and I. There are some people in prison, by the way, who stay in prison for a very long time, believe me. Um, but there's a lot of people who people don't understand that these heroin addicts are your family members. And, and until one of your family members becomes a heroin addict, it changes everything in your life. And so um, it's changed my perspective because it's far more real and I see it, of course, every day as commissioner. You're the, you were the superintendent at the McLaughlin Youth Facility. Do you run into inmates today that you saw there? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, I do sometimes. Um, and it's interesting um, when that happens. I. Um, we knew even in the juvenile system, even in the adult system, you're not going to get to everybody. But at some particular time, you have to give people a second and third and a fourth chance to make a change. That doesn't mean you don't hold them accountable. Of course you do. Uh, you're in prison, we have your freedom. But once we do have your freedom, then now you have another choice to make today. Um, and if you ever talk to anybody who's a heroin addict, I talk to a smoker, an ex-smoker. How many times do they take before they finally quit? And so how many more times do you need? Do you need another chance, another time after that? And finally, many do when given an opportunity to. Some don't and we can't reach everyone, but our goal is to provide meaningful opportunities for them to get a second and a third and fourth chance. The Lullaby Project next year would like to include men. What do you think about that? Uh, why not, right? I mean, the, um, <clears throat> there are many uh, men in prison who have children as well, and there are many men in prison who realize they um, want to make a life change. And so I'm looking for all those opportunities. I think we have to break down all those walls. So I've opened, I'm op I continue to open up the facilities as much as possible to welcome people in, to be part of the solution, um, because we can't fix this. Uh, I know that I have great staff, by the way, who, um, but they all recognize too that we can't fix this on our own. And so absolutely, great idea. Can't wait to see what they come up with. Right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. All right, Commissioner, yeah. thanks so much for yeah. being here and thanks. chatting with us. Thanks for having me.
Finally, we have one more note on the Lullaby Project. It's run by the Keys to Life program. If you're interested in finding out more or buying any of the CDs to support the project, you can go to keystolifealaska.com for more information. We leave you now with one of the songs on the Lullaby CD performed by a woman who was once inside but is now on the outside paying it forward. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.